Hi everyone. Uh, okay, let me close this first. So, the title of my presentation is "Activism's Bold: Slinking and Rejected." And I mentioned this to someone who said that I should probably explain this to the audience today. So I'm going to do that. Um, there was a phrase that I heard early on when I was getting to know the Singapore, the local Singapore scene in terms of civil society, and that was, "Don't call me an activist." Uh, this phrase animated my early intuitive understanding of local civil society. So the title of this talk encompasses that, the figure of the environmentalist who made this declaration, but also the ingenuous, white-eyed young person who's trying to make change, and we see so many people like that now, um, who loudly proclaim their cause, the experienced hands who found their footing in the crowd, and the, ex and the ones who are surveying, observing, who are cautious be before they leap into something. <coughs> So I bring these figures up as figures, not individual persons or groups. Because in this few mi minutes, I want us to think past the who, to the how and the what, uh, of you know, what, how civil society is being produced in Singapore. So if civil society is like a volleyball game or a soccer game, uh, and the, then the only way to win the game is for us to see where everyone else physically and mentally. So I'll try to bring up some questions, and I'll have more questions than answers in this talk. So I've looked at why activisms, but the next point is, what is the starting point? What's the ideological starting point? And for me, I'm constantly asking myself, when I try to do something that is civil society related, um, is the work I do going to be, ha does it have any chance of being co-opted by something, whether it's the state, whether it's capital? So the focus of this is to look at possible paths to the future. And my aim here is not to pinpoint rights and wrongs, as um, Aiwa Ong and Ananya Roy point out in their book, Worlding Cities, we see the collision of seemingly paradoxical impulses, political entrepreneurialism and anti-neoliberalism, a proliferation of neoliberal techniques that contributes to a blossoming of unanticipated borrowings, appropriations and alliances that cut across all, all lines and ideologies, diversity included. So rather than judgments of right and wrong, uh, they say it's the singularity and complexity of phenomena that we should be looking at in order to understand and analyse a range of urban initiatives that are transforming our city. And indeed, as David Harvey notes as well, the active sense of insurgent citizenship, as James Holston calls it, has nothing to do with Henri Lefebvre's legacy, but everything to do with ongoing struggles over who gets to shape the qualities of urban daily life, of what's out there on the streets, who and what people are responding to. So these are some of the things I was thinking about when I, when I was asked to give this talk. I was thinking about gentrification in Singapore, changing um, spaces and lost sites um, of what public life is, of the fact that we are always focusing on vulnerable communities but not so much looking at what public goods there are and what, what needs to be pursued, um, even if it's only a minority that needs it. So I also wanted to talk about civil society. Um, what does it actually mean and what has Singapore come to in terms of what it is today. The reason why I brought up different kinds of activisms is because for a long time the idea of activism in Singapore has been so, um, has been seen in a negative light in some, in some ways. Um, so Mike Douglas, who works a lot in um, urban geography as well and sociology, looks at civil society as the totality of voluntary associations. Um, they have significant autonomy from state and economy, and I'm not sure to what extent we actually have this in Singapore. But the thing is, it's not just Singapore that faces this problem. Um, the same goes for outside Singapore and North America as well. Uh, leftist politics in the West has gotten increasingly tame. Socialism has been co-opted into electoral politics instead of working class direct action, and we've seen this increasingly over the last 40 years. So capital has gotten more intertwined with politics, um, civil society models suggest the need to curb governmental excess and rein in government. And that differs from the more consensual mode of civil society that some people um, have spoken about in looking at Southeast Asian civil society. So this means that antagonism has been largely the rule. And given the circumstances of a belligerent government, perhaps it's necessary. So while the model of civil society that evolved 40 years after the Cold War was largely not as radical or direct as it used to be before, Working within institutional boundaries, it was still often framed as needing to lobby governments rather than work with government. So we ended up, or rather, 
North American politics ended up with the figure of the labor union worker as someone who ought to be distrusted to some extent, as an official who increasingly works not for those they represent, the working class, but those who see their organizations as ends in themselves. And I bring this up because even though this is kind of distance from Singapore, where we don't actually have working unions, um, we do see figures like this in, uh, in government and civil society as well. So the source of, so these people are far more reformist in outlook. They would prefer to work through electoral politics and the source of the bread and butter the organizations they work for. So instead, I want to turn to an anecdote that I uh, recently encountered where I was attending a meeting of youth convened by two members of parliament. And halfway through, a lady stood up and said that she wore the badge of the young PAP very proudly. And for her, it was a political cause she was fighting for. The, and she mentioned that the young PAP was having problems working with the Youth Executive Committee. Um, because the YEC, the Youth Executive Committee, refused to work with a political organization. That was posing a major barrier to um, different parties being able to bring their resources to bear. And all she wanted to do was to work for the people. So the room stayed quite quiet, but there were a lot of murmurings and shiftings. And someone next to me said, in that case, she shouldn't bring up politics at all. And I'm bringing this up because here we see the figure of the young political party hopeful, who is loudly declarative and very strong in her beliefs. And on the other side of it, we had a lot of people who were working with youth community development, who were very quiet, very unobtrusive, not particularly visionary in see seeking change, but wanting to fill the gaps in a very needs-based approach. And amass, it's a whole group of young people who are sitting, waiting, and looking, looking at their leaders to tell them what to do. So the politics of the possible in Singapore is narrowed to a very self-help mentality, but not the widening of public interest and public space, especially so when public interest has been subsumed by national economic growth goals and middle-class aspirations. This, for me, raises some questions about whether there's any value to pursuing a civil society for itself um, whether, what, what's the kind of politics we want to see in Singapore and um, in other urban cities as well. And should we trust sources of funding? How can we tell the difference between something that's very related to um, uh, state-focused policies or capital-influenced policies? So what form of governance do we want? So I tried to do a bit of thinking about this. And for me, I've read a bit about um, so from an eco-Marxist point of view, John Dryzak looks at environmental discourse. And for him, he tries to look at different civil society actors, discourses that come out. He looks at, um, he differentiates between reformist and radical uh, organizations and discourses, and prosaic and imaginative visions of the world. So this was something I tried to see whether we could apply to civil society in Singapore. And I changed a bit of uh, the reformist and radical notions to look more at the degree of change to which people felt um, organizations could change the way they worked with individuals and others. And I didn't want it to just come from myself, so I tried to ask people around me. In a very short span of days, five days, um, we had 17 responses, which is not large, but it does provide us with some understanding of how people, uh, in at least the social circle that I know, um, see different organizations in Singapore. So there was a, a range of responses from different age groups, uh, mostly in my age groups, so 25 to 29, but a bit above and, and below. And I'm showing you the one that shows um, the, the organizations that were mo mentioned most times, this, which is quite opposed to the, the entire set of data. So if you look at the entire set of data, all four segments are kind of filled up, which suggests that there's a good range of different actors. But if you look at the one where organizations were mentioned more often, you find that they tend to be in the right top right-hand segment, which is um, the segment that says they're more imaginative and they're more, uh, they seek larger change in working with organizations, changing the way they work with government structures. Um, what's also interesting is that we have both quite well-known organizations and initiatives coming up and also quite young ones. Uh, well-known ones include Green Drinks, Post Museum, Pink Dot and Aware. And it's also interesting to see where Pink Dot is on this spectrum. So Pink Dot is actually in the lower left uh, spectrum, which means that it's less imaginative and less uh, is trying to push the boundaries of what could be done in Singapore less. And in the top right segment, you see a lot more um, of the younger ones, like Sustainable Living Lab, Ground Up Initiative, Play Moolah as well, which is 
perhaps lesser known, but it's trying to do something with relating to monetary understandings of how to work with the money form. So wrapping up, um, I, I say here that we're nearing the tipping point, but I don't really think that we're getting there soon enough. Um, but I do feel that Singapore's civil society, or sense of it over the years, has changed um, with a slightly younger generation with a different state approach to it. I see a lot more new movements made out of people previously not active in urban struggles, um, possibly a repoliticization of the urban development and planning process. And here I want to mention also participate in design, which is a group of young architects who are trying to change the way um, the state can work with community. Um, there's changes in technology and economy. Uh, one of the examples of this is, of course, Sustainable Living Lab that's trying to get people together to think differently about technology, economy, and sharing economy as well. And climate, uh, climate change pressures is of course, are, of course, changing urban governmentality uh, approaches. Um, and I cite uh, a writer, May, who said that to govern the lives of their own population, states must now govern the lives of the global population. And this brings us back also to um, Ong and Roy's way of looking at worlding cities. Singapore is very much framing itself as a global city. A lot of the memes and schemes that we have are kind of interreferenced and borrowed and appropriated in this way. And so in some way, the memes and the, the wordings support, um, global memes and schemes support local actors who look to these different approaches and who would not have the support to push for something they really believe in, if not for these things. And lastly, there is an impact on civil society. When you have a democratized form of um, technology, you are able to create more partnerships, more visibility, and a greater ease of association, which is what some people see civil society as. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much.